We'll turn with me this morning in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 20 as we continue our study through this first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 20. If you're new to the Bible, new to church, that's okay. You'll find the book of Genesis pretty quickly, just open up to the first few pages. The chapters are the big numbers, the verses are the small numbers, those will help us to navigate through the text this morning and uh, we encourage you to follow along. Over the past, say, 15 years or so, the Marvel superhero movies have dominated the box office in the United States and really around the world. Uh, It's dominated in many ways the collective consciousness uh, of America. It's not uncommon to walk around uh, town or walk down on the boardwalk and uh, see Marvel shirts on people, uh, different characters, uh, different superheroes. Uh, Some movie critics have credited the popularity of this series to the relatability of the heroes portrayed, that they they seem very relatable, very much like us. And of course, if we're honest, right, everyone on some level wants to be a hero. And, And the thing about the Marvel characters is that the Marvel characters suggest that that might actually be possible for us, right? I mean, if Spider Man's If uh, Peter Parker can become Spider-Man, then surely I've got a shot. I mean, he was kind of a nerdy kid, right? And and look at all that he does. He swoops in from the skyscrapers and saves people and and rescues people, does all of these amazing things. And so surely maybe me, just normal old me, you know, whose life appears to be fairly boring and mundane, maybe I can be like that. And so we flock to the movie theater, we watch on our, we stream on our TVs, the Marvel movies, and at least for two hours on some level, we believe that maybe we might just have it within us to rise up and save the day. And you know, it's interesting that there are many people, including many Christians, who approach the Bible the same way that they approach Marvel movies. They think that the Bible is is kind of a compilation of loosely connected stories involving seemingly normal people who face great challenges and sinister villains, yet rise to the occasion and and do great things and and save the day. And, And that's how many people believe the Bible story to be. In fact, the story of Abraham and Lot, which we've been looking at for several weeks now, might appear on the surface to be just such a story. You remember in chapter 12 of Genesis, God called Abraham to leave his home in Ur and to go to a land that he would show him. He, he promised Abraham, I will make you a great nation and, and, and a great people will descend from you. You will be blessed and, and blessing will flow from you. And in time, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And of course we know, as we've seen, this ultimate blessing through Abraham came in Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Abraham is the forefather of Jesus himself. And so it is through Abraham's line that salvation comes in Jesus. And so he is the blessing. And that's the promise. And of course, Abraham doesn't know all of the details about this, but, but he has enough information to, to trust God. And so he does. He believed God. He left his hometown, which in that day was a, a very big deal. You didn't just pick up and leave, right? It was a dangerous thing to do that. You, you lose your, your wealth, your, your, your support system, all of those things which, which would have been Uh, people would have depended on in ancient times you would leave that and move to a land that God says I will show you he didn't even tell him where it was And Abraham goes he goes to Canaan with his wife Sarah and with his nephew Lot and pretty early in the story of course we find that Lot through a series of terrible choices ends up living among the enemies of Abraham and the enemies of God. When you compare the two men, as we kind of saw last week, we find that Lot begins to look more and more kind of like a hapless villain. 
And Abraham is the righteous hero. And so the storyline is set, right? We, we've got kind of a Marvel Universe story right here in the Bible, or so we think. Abraham, of course, shows himself to be a man of character oftentimes. In chapter 13, he and Lot find themselves competing for the same pasture lands. And so Lot, or Abraham, graciously offers Lot his pick of any land that, that was there in Canaan. You can have any of the land you want. And so, of course, what does Lot do? Lot takes the best of the land. He gives no real consideration for his uncle Abraham. And he goes and he takes the best of the land. And, of course, we are told there in chapter 13 that, that he moved his tents as far as Sodom. And then it says in the footnotes that Sodom was a very wicked city. And then again, later in that same passage, it says this was before the Lord destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So, so Lot is moving in that direction. And then, of course, it's not too awful long after that, that in the next chapter we find Lot living in the city of Sodom. And, and, and of course, there was a war that had broken out and, and some kings and warlords had come in and, and taken captive the inhabitants of Sodom, Lot among them. And this word of this comes to Abraham. And so Abraham gets a group of men together, trained men, and they go in and they rescue Lot and his family. So we begin to see Lot's choices are producing poor consequences, bad consequences. So Lot is rescued by his uncle Abraham. And then by the time we come to chapter 19, which we've looked at for the past several weeks, we find Lot sitting at the gate of Sodom. And that phrase, sitting at the gate, is, is, a, is an ancient term for sitting, in the seats of, sitting among the seats of influence. And you're sitting among the men of influence. And the city gate was where all of the, the affairs of the city would have been handled. It was kind of like city hall, as it were. And Lot is sitting there. And so Lot's pitched his tents, the old King James says, as far as Sodom. Then we find him in Sodom. Then he's sitting in the gate. So we see this progression. And, and of course, as Lot is sitting there in, among the, the men in the city gates, we find that these two angelic visitors come and, and, they, uh, and, and, and he welcomes them into his home. He brings them into his house. And of course, that evening after dinner, before they turn in for the night, we find that all of the men of the city, we're told, every one of them, young and old, comes to the house of Lot and they demand that he turn over these visitor, visitors in order that they might violate them. And you remember what Lot does. He pleads with the men not to do this wicked thing. And, and then in, in an un, in unconscionable act, he offers up his own daughters. Here, take my virgin daughters. They've never known a man. And, and, and do what you will with them, but don't harm my guests. And this, of course, does not appease the mob. As we saw, and so the angel sees Lot and his family, take them out of the city and tell them to run for the hills, lest they be destroyed along with the city. And God spared Lot and his daughters, spared them from destruction, but even their deliverance was the result of Abraham's prayer. Righteous Abraham's prayers are ultimately what led to their salvation. His intercession led to their deliverance. I mean, what a man Abraham has turned out to be. We might read the story and think that, you know, God really made a good choice when he picked that guy. God's lucky to have such a man as his partner in saving the world. I mean, sure, Abraham was flawed. He certainly made some mistakes in the past, but I mean, look how far he's come from, from back in the day when he gave his wife to Pharaoh and back when he made that mistake, right, with Hagar, the handmaid. I mean, I mean, look now, he's, he's obeyed God in circumcision. I mean, good grief, that's a pretty big step, right? I mean, he obeyed God there without question. He's, he, he's, he interceded for Lot. I mean, he's doing well. His track record is great. He's learned his lesson. You remember when the visitors came there to his tent at Mamre, one of the visitors being the Lord himself, he welcomed the Lord joyfully into his presence and, 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 he, and there he interceded, remember, for Lot. And of course, remember, before the Lord left Abraham and Sarah there in Mamre, you remember what he said? He said, in one year, the son of promise will be born to you. 
When I come back next year, this time, the son of promise will be born. So finally, just one more year, and Abraham's faith will become sight. You can do it, Abraham. Hang on for one more year. That's all you got to do. One more year, and you'll get your cape. Look, at with, look with me at Genesis chapter 20 this morning, where we read of the story of Abraham and Abimelech. Chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, and just follow along as I read. This is the word of the Lord. From there, Abraham journeyed towards the territory of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because, you, because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother? In the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I've done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart. And it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things, and the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? And Abraham said, I did it because I thought that there is no fear of God at all in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God calls me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone you are vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah Abraham's wife. This is the word of the Lord. Well, so much for Abraham getting his cape. So much for Abraham the hero. Abraham's actions here are quite shocking. I mean, think about it for a moment. He has just witnessed the overwhelming power of God's wrath as it has been poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. He has witnessed the saving power of God in his deliverance from destruction, Lot and his family. And yet now, here we are, after all of this, and we find Moses or Abraham right back where he started, throwing his wife under the bus in order to save his skin. Abraham, of course, was a sojourner. And we read here that his, his travels had now taken him to this unfamiliar area occupied by a pagan people. The, these pagans will later in the scriptures be identified as the Philistines. That's who we're talking about here. And, and once again, we find him fearing for his life once again. And so, as he has done in the past, he resorts to scheming. In verse 2, we read here, notice, Abraham said of his wife, said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister... And Abimelech, now Abimelech is, is not the name, it's the title. It's kind of like Pharaoh. So there were multiple Pharaohs there. You'll see this as you go through the Old Testament. There are multiple Abimelechs. It was the Philistine name for their leader. So, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Wow. I mean, I guess you could say what Abraham lacks in creativity, he makes up for in consistency. 
right? You remember back in chapter 12 what happened. There's a famine in Canaan, so what is what does Abraham do? Instead of trusting God, he goes to Egypt and he seeks help in Egypt. And, and, and when he gets there, on his way there, he tells Sarah, look, remember, remember, when we get into the city, tell them that you're my sister. So that way they won't kill me and take you. And so they go into the city and the scheme worked, right? Abraham didn't get killed. But what happened? They still took his wife, and not just any Egyptian took his wife, Pharaoh took his wife. And here again we find Abraham engaging in the same scheme, just like in Egypt. And the results are the same. This time the king of Gerar, Abimelech, took Sarah as his wife or his concubine, and essentially took her into his harem as it were. I mean, th- when you think about it, this is an incredible lack of faith on Abram's part, right? I mean, we, we said that in Egypt, Abraham had, you remember back in chapter 12, we said that Abraham only considered that there were two options available to him, right? Number one, they find out that she's my wife, they kill me and take her. Or my, the other option is, I tell them she's my sister and they spare me. He never considered that there was a third option, and that third option was that God would keep his promise, which he had just made to him. That God would keep his promise and protect Abraham, keep his marriage intact, and spare his life. That never seemed to occur to Abraham there in Egypt. But this time, what makes this so shocking is now Abraham is aware that there are three options, and he knows it from his own experience. He knows it from what happened there in Egypt. And yet he still lies. Aren't you glad you don't do that? Glad you laughed. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. We see this laid out here. Abraham failed to trust the Lord and and found himself caught in a snare. He may very well, yes, have saved his own life, but he put his his wife's life in danger and, more importantly, the promise of God in jeopardy, as we'll see. This is a big deal. But God is faithful. God is true to his promise. Just as he did in Egypt, he did in Gerar. Notice verse 3, we're told here that that God appeared to Abimelech in a dream in in, in, Egypt. In Egypt, he sent plagues to the house of Pharaoh. Now, he actually appears or speaks to Abimelech in a dream. And and it's pretty clear. The message is unmistakable. Verse 3. Behold, in other words, listen up. You are a dead man. That's not the kind of dream you want to have, is it? You are a dead man. And then he explains why. Because of the woman whom you have taken. For she is a man's wife. Sanctity of marriage matters to God. We talked about that back in Genesis 1 and 2. God joins a man and the woman together, right? We refer to that as the holy estate of matrimony and weddings. God takes that seriously. And he tells the king of Gerar, he tells Abimelech, you're going to die because you've taken another man's wife. Of course, Abimelech responds, notice, he pleads his case in verse 4. Now, Abimelech had not approached her. There's a little editorial footnote there. We're told there was no contact between him and Abimelech yet. We, we knew that also in, in, in Egypt. And a lot of times, this was very typical in antiquity. You remember when Esther was taken into the king's court? There was a period of purification which would take place. Most likely, something similar here had happened, as well as the fact, as we'll see, uh, something had fallen upon Abimelech to where evidently he could not engage in that way with a woman, and all of the wombs of the, of the people of Gerar, the women of Gerar, had been closed. So something is going on here uh, in addition to just uh, this, this potential period of purification. But we're told there that he had not approached her. And so he says to the Lord, notice, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he, speaking of Abraham, not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he's my brother. They both told me this, Lord. And then he says, in the integrity of my heart, in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Abimelech's like, I had no idea 
that she was married. I had no idea. I thought this was his sister. They both told me this. I, I, God, I, Lord, I'm just doing, I, I'm just going off the information that I have. I, I didn't know. He insists that he is innocent. He insists that his motives are pure. And of course, God affirms this. Notice in verse 6, he, he speaks to Abimelech. And he affirms that, yes, I know that you have done this. And the Hebrew there is interesting. It's kind of like God is saying, yeah, I, I, I know that. I already know this, right? I, I, I'm aware of the situation. You don't have to explain it to me. I'm aware that you're innocent. I'm aware that you're innocent as a result of your ignorance. And then he reveals that it was not because of any good intention on Abimelech's part that he didn't sin. But notice, God says this. It was not because of any integrity in your heart. It was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Notice God's words. I kept you from sinning against who? Me. Not Abraham, but me. The sin in play here was not first a sin against Sarah or even Abraham, but against God. Why is that? Because the sin would have been particularly destructive to the promise of God. And this is, friends, where we need to understand that there are forces at work that we cannot see. There are, are forces of darkness at work that we cannot see. And, and, and we see that throughout the Old Testament. It's like you see all of these activities and events, and, and, and there are these, there, there's, you would think that this is just happenstance, but beneath that, there is, there is an enemy who is after the seed of the woman and is seeking at every turn to destroy the seed of the woman. Sometimes you'll see his head pop above the surface, but many times he's just at work in the lives and circumstances of the people, causing them to doubt. Just like in Job, Job never saw Satan, but Satan was there working, stirring up doubt, stirring up suffering and pain and causing grief for him. And, and something like this is going on here. God had promised, you remember, that the child of promise would come through Abraham and Sarah. Both of them. And in fact, it's possible that Sarah was already pregnant at this point. We're not told how far this was, but this was sometime between the promise before the destruction of Sodom when God said, one year you'll have a child, the child will be born, and the birth of the child, which we'll see next week. So sometime, could be that she is not yet conceived, this is early in that year, could be that she's within the nine months and she's already pregnant, maybe not visibly so, whatever the case might be. But God had promised that the child would come through Abraham and Sarah. And you remember in Genesis 3.15, God said that, there, that, that he was going to send one from the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. But he said that there would be enmity, there would be conflict between these two seeds. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent is not just humanity, but it's all the forces of darkness, the forces of Satan at work in that line. And they are attacking, and, and we see that here. If, if, think of all that, could, that would have happened here. Satan knows that the promised deliverer who will bring salvation to the world is to come through the line of Abraham. So but what, what better way to stop this from happening than to disrupt or destroy the physical line in its infancy? Cast doubt on it. Hey, you know that baby that Sarah had? We don't really know who's the father. We can't be sure it was Abraham. It could have been Abimelech. So you can see the attacks on this line. And you'll see this all throughout the Old Testament. You'll see it constantly popping up. If the promise of God were to fail here, then... That would mean that God did not have the power to bring it to pass. And there would be no security or assurance of salvation. You know, R.C. Sproul used to always say, if there's one random, one, uh, one rogue molecule in the universe outside of God's control, you cannot stake your claim on any promise of God. None. He must be in control of everything. It's the only way prophecy can come true. It's the only way the promise of salvation can come true is if he is the one who is ordering and ordaining all things. So God intervenes. He tells Abimelech to return Sarah to Abraham. And this, I always chuckle when I see this. I'm thinking, if I'm Abimelech and I hear God say this to me, I'd be like, 
what? He says, return her and you'll live because he's a prophet and he'll pray for you. Like, I don't know if I want that guy praying for me, right? That, I mean, that would be my first thought, right? He's a prophet after doing this and, and, and you're telling me that he'll pray for me and I'll live? And of course, God promises that the converse will happen as well, right? If you don't return her, then you will die and all who are yours will die. And of course, we we're told here that Abimelech wakes up early in the morning, obviously, after a dream like that, and he calls his servants, and, and we're, when he recounts this to his servants, his servants are filled with fear. They're, they're scared to death, understandably so. This reminds you a little bit of Nineveh, right? When the warning of God comes to them, everyone expects that they're going to blow it off, but they repent. And here we see that they are filled with fear. And, and so Abimelech then calls Abraham to him and questions him. Notice verse 9. What have you done to us? I mean, here's Abraham, the great patriarch, standing before the king of Gerar, before Abimelech. And Abimelech, this pagan king, is scolding the man of God. What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you see that you did this thing? And I was explain this to me. Ironically, God uses this pagan king to rebuke Abraham for his deceit. He's baffled by Abraham's actions. Even this pagan king can't understand why a man would do this. Why would a man who is a guest in our land put us in such jeopardy? And, and I want you to notice the judgments that Abimelech makes. They're moral judgments. Listen to the language, right? And how have I sinned against you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? And then the next statement, you have done to me things that ought not to be done. That's a moral judgment. That's a moral statement. That's appealing to something outside of yourself, right? So C.S. Lewis used to say that uh, in his opening chapter of Mere Christianity, which is titled Right and Wrong as a Clue to the Meaning of the Universe, says that that the the, the existence of the word ought, O-U-G-H-T, tells us that there is a law or a moral code outside of ourselves that we all recognize to be true. Whether you, whether you agree with it or not, it's true. The fact that I can say to you, you ought not to do that, demonstrates that I'm appealing to something that we both recognize is not opinion. It's hard truth set within the moral universe, as it were. And, and, and Abimelech does this. He's, he's appealing to this. Like, both of us know this is not right. You shouldn't have done this. So, I mean, this is a pagan king making moral judgments and moral pronouncements to this man of God. And of course, Abraham responds to Abimelech with just an absolutely pathetic excuse. You can almost sense the sheepishness in his voice as he's saying this. Notice, I did this because I thought. Well, you thought wrong, Abraham. I thought. That's your problem. You thought. You should have trusted. I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. Never given thought to the fact that, is it possible that God could have been at work in Gerar? Verse 12, besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God calls me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is the kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. He offers three excuses for his actions. First, he believed that, again, the people of Gerar do not fear God. And ironically, what's interesting here, in this account, there's only one who fears God. Who is it? Abimelech. It's not Abraham. I mean, I know we've never done this, right? Pass judgment on someone else for something we do, right? But you see that at work here? Abraham has no fear of God. Remember this now. Go back to Proverbs, our study of Proverbs last summer, right? The fear of the Lord... It's the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. What is the fear of the Lord? Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. He will make your path straight. That is what it means. That is, that is wisdom. That is the fear of the Lord. So Abraham, by definition, is not fearing the Lord. But Abimelech demonstrates a fear of the Lord. It's, this is incredible. It's Abraham who commits the treacherous act, not Abimelech. Again, it's interesting, too, to note that the only one of whom integrity and innocence is spoken of is Abimelech, not Abraham. Abraham is not made to look good in this story. Second, he reveals that he and Sarah are, in fact, half-brother and sister. So therefore, as if maybe that makes the lie a little better because it's only half-truth. Technically wasn't a lie. And of course, this relationship would, uh, like this would eventually, when the law of Moses comes along, would be condemned and forbidden. At this point, it doesn't appear that there's a law uh, against this or that, that it is considered taboo or socially taboo or evil. But the, the excuse is a pathetic one. Third, Abraham explains that it's nothing personal, Abimelech. This, we, we didn't have you in mind. We, we planned this. We cooked up this thing when we left Ur. And we said, whatever city we come into, Sarah, say this for me, okay? I mean, what a stellar husband this guy is, right? You know, help, help me out, Sarah. I don't, you know, I don't want to get in any trouble. I don't want to get killed or thrown in jail. So just tell this half-truth. He said, when we left Ur, it's what I told her to do. Even here, it's interesting. We see the fear of man on display. You don't pick it up in the English Bible, but you do in the Hebrew Bible. When Abraham says this, and when God calls me to wander from my father's house, he doesn't use the, the, the singular God. He uses the plural, gods. So essentially what Abraham says here is, when the gods called me, to move from my father's house. Derek Kidner writes, he says of this language, it is, the la- it is the language and the wry attitude of a pagan. One man of the world might as well just be speaking to another. It's the fear of man. Abraham is stricken with the fear of man. And, and think about it, how humiliating it must have been for Abraham, the one who was to be the blessing to all the families of the earth, to stand before this pagan king and to have to verbalize his sinful conniving. You ever been there where you actually, you start explaining yourself and as you're explaining your reasoning, you're like, oh, this sounds really, really bad, right? As long as it was up here, it all made sense. But now that it's coming out of my mouth, I realize, oh man, I look like a fool. So Abraham's spilling the beans on himself. I mean, here he is having to admit to Abimelech, who apparently has more respect for marriage than Abram does, that instead of protecting his wife, he put her in danger in order to save his own skin. That the morally superior Abimelech would have to ask a faithless Abraham to pray for him Shows the fallibility of Abraham, but also the incredible faithfulness of God. And what happens next is even more incredible. And you'll see this happen throughout the scripture multiple times, not just with Abraham, but with other patriarchs and even the children of Israel as a whole when they leave Egypt. Verse 14, then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham And returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given your brother. I like that. Your brother. I don't know if that's cynicism or what. A thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone you are vindicated. And that that gift of the money was was kind of a, a... a public testimony that he had not been with her, that was like a way of vindicating her innocence, as it were, or, or, or that she was, there had been no adultery. Verse 17, then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech and also healed his wife and female slaves so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So this must have been going on for a period of time to know that their fertility had been affected. 
But here, it's interesting. Not only does Abimelech refuse to stand in judgment of Abraham, but rather he blesses him. He blesses him. He returns Sarah to him, gives him all of this livestock, gives him servants, and tells him, you're welcome to live anywhere in the land that you would like. And this demonstrates once again God's intention to keep his promise to Abraham no matter what. And that's what you have to understand is going on here. This is God's way of showing to Abraham you can't mess this up. You cannot stop my promise. It is going to come to pass. I will see to it. The promise, as we said, was unconditional. God was the one who walked between the animals. It wasn't God and Abraham. It wasn't like, Abraham, you keep up your end of the bargain, I'll keep up mine, and, and we'll bring this thing to pass. No, Abraham, God, God told Abraham, I will do this thing. This is my promise. And it's a promise not just to you, but to your children and their children and to all the families of the earth. I will see this through. And so he blesses Abraham incredibly, even in the midst of his sin. And then we're told that Abraham prays. Can you imagine how humbling this prayer must have been? And God accepts his prayer. God answers Abram's prayer. Abraham's prayer, he he heals Abimelech, heals Abimelech's household, opens the womb of Abimelech's wife and the wombs of his servants. And Abraham must have been humbled by the grace of God. Of God. What is the grace of God? The grace of God is unmerited favor. I think it was Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones used to say when you're preaching the gospel of grace, if no one accuses you of scandal, you're probably not preaching it right. Romans tells us that, right? In Romans chapter 6, Paul is anticipating this very question. Well, if, if should we continue in sin that grace may abound? If, if this is all of grace, and it's not by works, it's not on the basis of our performance, then why not just rack up the sin and get more grace? It is, it's scandalous. Of course, Paul goes on to explain that if you ask that question, you don't understand grace. But here we see this grace, unmerited favor poured out upon Abraham. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves when we read this story, it is, it's quite a twisted story. It's weird, it's strange on multiple levels, but why is this story here? I mean, we already knew that Abraham failed this test, right? We already have this story essentially told already back in Genesis 12 when he was in Egypt. Why do we have to have it again? In fact, some have even speculated, well, maybe it's not a, maybe it's the same story, but it's it's been, the names have been changed, it's told twice, you know, it was a, a mix-up, someone inserted it here incorrectly and, and got the, the information wrong. I, no, that doesn't, there's too many details here that don't, don't make that, don't, don't seem to fit the, that reality. So why include Abraham's failure with Abimelech here? Why? I believe it's very intentional that this less than flattering account is given to us this close to the fulfillment of the promise in the very next chapter. And I think it's here to teach us two truths. The first truth is this. The best of men are men at best. And secondly, God is the hero of the story of redemption. The best of men are men at best. I love that, that quote. It's not original with me. It's a quote by J.C. Ryle. And I love that quote. The best of men are men at best. The fact that Abraham found himself facing the same test with Abimelech that he faced with Pharaoh tells us something of the way that God works in his people. That we we are not holy men. We, We are not... Abraham is not a patriarch who's somehow elevated because of his good character. God didn't choose Abraham because he thought Abraham was 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 a great man to have on his team. He didn't choose Abraham because Abraham was a righteous man. He chose Abraham and declared him righteous. And not on the basis of anything that Abraham had done, but simply on the 
basis of Abraham's faith. But God is at work here in Abraham's life. And, and you see this, this process that, that God is, is going through with Abraham. You see how he works in the lives of his people. You remember in growth groups last year, we went through a course called Processing Life Biblically. And I thought, man, this is, this is a perfect example of, of this happening, of, of this, this, uh, this work in, God's, in, in Abraham's life, God's work in Abraham's life. Remember, God has an agenda. The agenda here is that you would trust me, right? The agenda for Abraham is to trust me. But Abraham had an agenda too, didn't he? What was his agenda? Preserve my life. And so God brings him into Egypt, and what happens? The agendas clash. And of course, Abraham fails the test. And then he comes again to Abimelech. You see, God sent Pharaoh and Abimelech as a test designed to create this conflict between these competing agendas. In that moment when Abraham was faced with a choice, trust the God who has revealed himself to me or take matters into my own hands. And both times he chose the latter. And both times he experienced the fallout from his lack of faith. Have you been on that cycle? Have you seen yourself there? Where your agenda comes into conflict with God's. And, and suddenly God brings a test. You, you mess it up royally. And then we're surprised to find that in the not too distant future. The test comes around again. Maybe with a different person. But it's the same test. And it continues to come. And it continues to come. And God reveals our sin. He reveals our lack of faith. God will bring these same tests. He will bring similar experiences into our lives repeatedly to teach us to trust him. That, and, and, and think about it. Trusting God is the greatest good. Therefore, we should expect that God would continue this work in us throughout our lives. So don't be surprised when you find yourself facing the same test. Look beyond the test to see what God wants to teach you. What is it that God is saying here? Dr. John Currid writes this. He says, each of us has deeply worn channels of corrupt nature, besetting sins that refuse to let go. Sometimes we do it without even thinking, or it's our instinct, right? I've used this illustration many times. You know, I've, I've been coming to this place for almost 19 years now. My office is in the front building. Every day, I come to that stop sign, and you know which way I turn? Left. There are days I get home, I walk in the house, I don't even remember driving home. You ever had that happen? I don't even remember it. Unless something happens, you know, somebody pulls out in front of me or, you know, I'm listening to a podcast or something. I get home, I don't even remember driving home. And then some days my wife will be like, oh, hey, can you go down to Giant and pick something up to bring home or somewhere? And you know what I do? I get to the stop sign and guess which way I turn? Left. Giant's that way. And, and that's how the patterns of our sin work. We, we, we have these ruts that, that wear into our minds and our hearts, and that's what we do. And, and, and we, we continue to just turn left, almost as if by instinct. Courage continues. He says, each of us has deeply worn channels of corrupt nature, besetting sins that refuse to let go. And these sins come in cycles, he says. They revisit us time and again. Similar situations lead us to acts in a similar vein. But as in the case of Abraham, God continues to bring the situations upon us so that we should see our sin and that we should turn to him, that we should trust him and realize he will protect us. Such repetitive cycles highlight our besetting sins, but they also point us to a solution, which is complete trust and faith in God. So think about it. Every day I turn left out of the driveway and the first time I forget to go to Giant to get the produce or whatever I'm supposed to get, Right? I, I come home and to an unhappy wife. So do that two or three times and what happens? I begin to learn. I, when I pull up that stop sign, I need to ask myself, am I supposed to do something? Right? Yeah, I need to turn right. Right? And so God does that. He, he brings the sin into our minds. He brings the tension. He brings the conflict. And we begin to stop and say, wait a second, what am I doing here? 
Who am I trusting in? What, what, what's going on? And of course, these events are recorded here, leading us up to the promise to also remind us that Abraham is still just Abraham. Abraham is Abraham. Certainly he has grown in his faith, his, his knowledge of God, but he's still prone to wander. He's still prone to fail. You know, and so lest we come away from the story of Lot thinking that God was lucky to have him as a partner in saving the world, God drops chapter 18 in our laps. To remind us that the best of men are still men at best. You see, Abraham could not save himself, let alone anyone else. Abraham's best attempts at salvation resulted in failure, humiliation, and embarrassment. And the promise, if the promise, if the promise of God was to be fulfilled, that fulfillment could not and would never come through Abraham and his workings and his schemings. It couldn't. In fact, if it depended on Abraham... It's doomed, because every chance the man had, he jeopardized the promise, didn't he? Over and over again, the man jeopardized the promise. This is why Abraham could never be the hero of the story. A man in need of salvation cannot save anyone else. And that leads us to that second point. God is the hero of the story of redemption. You know, if you've grown up in the church for any length of time, you've likely heard phrases like this, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. Or face down your Goliaths. Sayings like these and others, while, while very popular, of course, even making their way into Christian music today, serve to promote this idea of the concept of a biblical hero, a Bible hero. Of course, some will point to Hebrews 11, right? The... the the chapter where all the saints of old are listed. And, and we find this list of well-known biblical characters, and we say, look, there are our heroes, but they're never called heroes. You see, the individuals named in Hebrews 11 are not known for what they did, but rather for whom they trusted in. They're not known for what they did. They're known for the one in whom they trusted who did great works through them. In fact, their failings are pretty pronounced all throughout. Even Hebrews 11. You see, we are not meant to go to passages like Hebrews 11 and say, wow, look at what these men did. No, we're to go to he passages like Hebrews 11 and say, look at what God did in the lives of men who would simply trust him. So Genesis 18 is here to remind us that Abraham is not the hero of the story. God is the hero of the story. If the promise were left up to Abraham, again, it would have failed. If God had not intervened in the promise... It would have failed. Time and again we see that God restrains the enemies of the promise and protects the recipients of the promise. You'll see that theme all throughout the Bible. That's, that reminds me of the words of the, of the great hymn, God's, uh, God's grace is greater than our sin. It overwhelms our sin. And, and God's grace also restrains the enemy of our soul and stops him and cuts him off at every turn. And that's what God is doing here. He's hemming in the promise of God protecting the people of God in this moment, even from themselves, even from their own foolishness. So when we come to next week in chapter 21, and we see the promise fulfilled in the birth of Isaac, we're going to realize Abraham had no hand in this. He had no hand in it. If it had been left up to Abraham... Chapter 21 would not have happened. Or if it did happen, there would have been questions and doubts. It was all of God and it was all of grace. And friends, if the promise is to be fulfilled, it must be all of God. And friend, this is very applicable to every one of us sitting in this room today. If salvation is going to come to us, it cannot come from us because we are in need of saving. We are not save yours. Salvation must come from outside of us. That's the story of Genesis 1 through 11. Over and over again, we see the wickedness of man, the evil of man. You put man in a, in a perfect environment, and time and again, he will fall. It was in paradise that man sinned. 
You can start all over again, washing the earth clean with wa- the waters of the flood. Start again with eight people, and again, they will mess it up over and over again. Genesis 1-11 through removes any idea or any claim that somehow we can save ourselves. We can remove ourselves from this predicament that we are in. If salvation is to come, it must come from outside of us. And friends, it has come from outside of us. It has come from outside of us in Jesus Christ. That is the story of redemption. That story begins in the book of Genesis and works its way all the way through the Old Testament and finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. In fact, you could look at the Old Testament and say the Old Testament is a story of struggle. A story of struggle of men and women continuing to sin, continuing to fail. Every priest, every prophet, every king failed. Just about the time you thought there was one who was going to do it right, whether it was David, whether it was Solomon, whether it was Ezra, Nehemiah, they all failed. And that failure sets us up to look for the one who will not fail. And that one who will not fail is Jesus. The Old Testament in many ways reads like a a story of exhausting all possibilities. So God gives us the Old Testament to show us that at every turn there's nothing but failure to leave us empty handed in asking God for help. And God sends help in Christ. 2,000 years ago God stepped out of heaven stepped out of eternity into time and space and took on flesh in Jesus, the second person of the Godhead. Jesus walked among this earth and he did what we couldn't do. In fact, not only what we couldn't do, he did what we wouldn't do. He lived a perfect life. You know what, what he did? He, you know the one thing he did that everyone else failed to do? He trusted God. He trusted the Father. At every turn in the Gospels, Jesus says, I did not come to do my will, but the will of my Father. Time and again, he proved himself obedient. He did that so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for us. He was perfectly obedient. And then the Bible says he went to the cross, and on the cross, he, the innocent one, died. He took our sin upon himself. Remember, a man in need of saving can save no one. Jesus was not in need of saving. He was without sin. He was perfect. And so as he hung on that cross... He was bearing our sin, my sin and your sin, and he died there for our sin. And the Bible says that three days later he rose again. And his resurrection proves that the sins for which he died were not his. Because if they were, he would still be in the grave. For the wages of sin is death. But the sins for which Jesus died were not his, and thus he rose from that grave. And the Bible makes this promise to you this morning, that if you will come in faith, Trusting in what God has done for you, not in what you have attempted to do for yourself, but trusting in what God has done for you in Christ, here's what God will do. He will take that perfect and sinless, obedient life of Jesus, and he will say, I'm going to credit that to you. I'm going to treat you like you lived that perfect life. And all the sin that you committed, all the rebellion, all of those things that you did, all of your failures, all of that, I'm going to count that as perfect. The penalty for that is paid in full because of what Jesus did on the cross. He died in your place. He took it all on on himself. And, And therefore, you are free and forgiven. And as if that was not enough, the Bible says that he also promises to give us that resurrection life so that we too, Paul says in Ephesians, can now walk in the newness of life as new creatures who are alive, who are awakened who are in tuned with the one who created us, who loved us and died for us. And friends, that is a promise of God. If you will trust him, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, who will trust in him, will be saved. Saved from the judgment to come. And I encourage you this morning to put your faith and your trust in him. Abraham, we know, is in heaven. Jesus said years later to the Pharisees, Abraham longed to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. But friends, Abraham did not go to heaven because he was a good man. Abraham went to heaven because he he put his faith and trust in a good God. And friend, you're here this morning, you will not get to heaven because you are a good person. 
It's true, good people go to heaven. The problem is there aren't any. So you won't get to heaven by being a good person. You will get to heaven by putting your faith and trust in the one who is good. And the one who has done for you what you could not do for yourself. And I encourage you to trust him. Let's pray. Thank you.